Hello ladies and gentlemen, I am Borderwise, and welcome back to From the Depths, where we're going to be covering the basic things you need to get started with any one of the From the Depths campaigns. Because as much as we all like messing about in the designer, eventually uh, the lure of the campaign and actually conquering uh, the world is too much to resist and we gotta go do that. So there's a bit of a checklist um, to make sure you've uh, filled out uh, before you uh, boot up the campaign. And then there's um, a bunch of things that is generally a good idea to do in the campaign uh, to get you started. So to start off with, uh, things to be aware of before you get busy. And the first one is the UI, because uh, the UI of the tactical map, which you do, which you reach by pressing E, and the main and the main map, which you hit by pressing M, uh, this stuff up here is actually kind of important and quite relevant uh, to how uh, you control your forces and deal with them uh, in the campaign itself. So we're gonna break down uh, this UI right here. Uh, we've got uh, a little fortress right here with a nice spinny satellite dish and we're going over uh, this UI first. Uh, the top row of this is essentially controlling uh, the vehicle's AI. So over here, uh, we've got um, uh, activating or deactivating uh, the weapons of the craft in question. This one doesn't have any weapons, so that one's basically useless. And over here, we've got uh, disabling movement, uh, turning the movement into automatic behavior mode, or turning it into patrol mode or fleet mode. And, um, Patrol mode is used to set up um, patrol routes uh, for your thing to follow, like so. And fleet mode is uh, used for a similar thing, except, um, yeah, these two things are very uh, similar. I'm not entirely clear what the difference is between them, but anyway. This is how you control your vehicles uh, from either the tactical screen or the map screen. The second uh, row of this UI is the pull in and out of play button. So, uh, in From the Depths, it's generally very, pretty bad for your PC to have too much stuff loaded in at the same time, or like, or if you have things loaded in that are very far away from each other. So, most of the time, your vehicles are going to be uh, out of play. So, this button is what you do. And what this does is that it basically um, deloads the thing as just existing as... Um, as a little template on the map, um, so you know where it is, and you can spawn it in back at any time, like if it goes into combat or if you need a build on it. So you push this again, and it's loaded back in, and it's all good. Uh, this button here, as the as it says in the tin, it teleports your avatar uh, to this force. So if we jump off uh, that harvester and take a swim, uh, you'll see that we're sinking, and I hit this button, and back we go. Very convenient. And the last button in the second row is to build on this force. So that button is only... Um, well, no, it does appear here, but I think it automatically pulls it into play. Yep, it does. It pulls it into play, and so you can build uh, on your force and do whatever you like, and it's very nice. So, yeah, that's that row. And now we've got uh, this third row right here. And the first one is uh, enabling repairs on the vehicle. So you need repair bots or a nearby within one kilometer repair tentacle uh, in order to do this. And this uh, vehicle already has full health, so we don't need to do that. And you can uh, disable that, enable that, disable that, enable that right there. Next you have force names. So if you want to tell your vehicles apart on the campaign uh, map and uh, want to differentiate different uh, forces just by uh, hovering your mouse over them, uh, you can rename them. So the force name here, I can call this Circle Harvester 1. And right here, you can see that uh, both um, on the vehicle itself, you hit the V menu here, it's called Circle Harvester 1. And on the map screen, it is also Circle Harvester 1. Uh, changing the fleet name does not change the name of individual vehicles, it changes the name of this group, so to speak. So if I go here, I can go Circle Harvesters 1. And you'll see that uh, it's now, as it appears on the map, it's called Circle Harvesters, plural one, uh, but the individual vehicle is still called Harvester One. So that's how you differentiate it there. 
And this button here is duplicating. So you select that, you hit duplicate. And you'll see that uh, we've got right here a dead blueprint of another circle harvester. And if we select that and we hit start repairs, um, it can start to be repaired. And you can see right here that even though uh, this harvester is out of is in play and this one is out of play, it's still repairing it. So that is a uh, super convenient. And moving right along, you can go here, let's duplicate, and now here's the retrofit button. So can you moving up. follow this guy, please? Moving up. And what are we talking about? All right. So the retrofit button. So uh, what this allows you to do is let's go over here actually. So let's retrofit this into a different one. So we go there. And uh, you can change it, uh, depending on how much it is, uh, into a different vehicle altogether. So if I pull this out of play, you'll see it's now... I've managed to transform it into a different uh, fortress, and actually an older one. And, um, uh, yeah, so that's quite handy uh, to do if you want to, say, uh, change one vehicle to another. And you can only change vehicles... Um, between uh, the same type. So uh, you have vehicles and you have fortresses and structures and you can't transform them back and forth. So if I hit retrofit on here and I say I want to go to say aircraft, airships and um, retrofitting can only be done between identical constructs uh, between identical construct types vehicles, structures and fortresses. So I can't do that because the thing I've selected is a vehicle not a fortress. So yeah that is a uh, that is that, and then this one is the auto update button. This utility will check for newer versions of your blueprints and allow you to automatically retrofit the latest version. It'll prompt you first so you can always change your mind. So um, this is very handy, especially if you have uh, things spread out across the entire map, um, because you can just select everything on the map, hit this button, and then it'll pop up um, and give you the option to update to the latest version, whatever that version is. So, Circle Harvester has local modifications from version 9, shall we revert? In this case, I want to say yes. You're already at the latest version of RTG Resource Platform version 15. Cool. So, we've just reverted um, this guy back to uh, the last saved version of it. So, it can do that as well. And over here, and let's select this guy actually. So, oh yeah, he, over here is the flagship of the fleet, so I can do that. It can be the flagship instead um that's mainly a preference thing and so yeah where were we so over here this recycle button uh, this is the scrapping uh, button so what this does is it destroys the vehicle returns 100 percent of the all the materials that it consists of and this will turn the force into a dead blueprint and not completely destroy it so if i hit this i'm gonna scrap it and you'll see it disintegrate and it's now a dead blueprint and i can repair it later so, yeah, the next button along, though, is the scrap this force is like the perma-delete button. It is um, scrapping the force and returning 100% of all materials, and it will destroy the force completely. So if I do that there, I will permanently destroy that blueprint, and now it's gone. So, yeah, the handy, just handy utility tools uh, for uh, use in the campaign. And last uh, thing on this level is the AI editor. So this is very similar to just clicking, uh, bringing up the C menu and clicking this button here. Uh, it just allows you to edit the AI of whatever uh, vehicle or craft you have selected. And you'll notice there's one more button here and this is a category all unto itself because this is the resource tab. So if we hit that button, which you can also do by hitting Control R in game, and hitting Control R there, hitting Control R there, Control R there, and you can also do it on the map screen, and it just shows you numerous handy uh, things. So over here, we're just going to go to the tactical screen. I'm going to click that button, and immediately you can see here there are three categories of resource holder, so to speak. You have uh, from right to left, you have users, um, which get filled up by creator and cargo vehicles. Uh, these are your combat craft. These are the things that actually burn through materials in order to lob shells, launch missiles, or fire lasers, or whatever. Then you have cargo uh, vessels, which take uh, which take materials from creators and give it to users. 
And then you have the creators, which uh, essentially are your resource harvesters. They harvest materials, they pass it on to cargo craft, which then pass it on to users. That's the most basic um, uh, thing you can... Uh, uh, that's the most that's the basic explanation of them. So from left to right in reverse order of my explaining them uh, Creators pass materials on to cargo and cargo passes materials on to users so Part of the doohickey with this is you can set what percentage of resources is kept or given or rather what is retained uh, by all the craft that you have so generally uh, creators and cargo vessels or craft there's multiple words for these things. Uh, they tend to keep very little. So this one is currently keeping a high level material. And we don't actually want that. In fact, uh, this particular uh, craft runs off RTGs. So it doesn't need any materials at all to function. So we can set it to keep no material at all, which is best for this particular vehicle. If your uh, creators or cargo uh, craft require materials in order to run, so if they're using... Um, a form of power generation like fuel engines or steam engines or custom jets uh, They will need material in order to function So you might want to set it just a little bit higher just keep just enough materials So they can move and they can harvest resources and do all that stuff and Generally users should be kept as full as possible because they're your fighting craft and uh, you don't want to send them into a fight, uh, specifically if you, especially if you get surprised by something on the map, which does happen. Um, you don't want to be sending them in with uh, not enough fuel and ammo uh, to fight effectively. You don't want them to be left running dry. So yeah, that's uh, the main difference between those three. And you can also set, and this is mostly useful for users, uh, to not share materials or energy with any other force. Because usually if you have something set to user, set it to full, they'll still share materials and energy with other users. So your combat vessels will generally equalize all the materials between them. Uh, but you can hit this button and that basically means that um, uh, they will uh, not share materials or energy with any other force. So they'll all be all take all and no give, so to speak. In this particular case, we want to keep this guy as a creator because that's what his job is. It's a harvester. And a little note just here on uh, commodities is that commodities I will cover in a different video because that's a whole different kettle of fish. And if you're just getting started a campaign, it's not that essential to know about how commodities work. You can, uh, in the campaign, you can just um, hover over a thing and you can hit F5 to start gifting uh, commodities uh, to the, whatever vehicle you're nearest to. Uh, or you can hit these buttons so you can just uh, gift your commodities, which is like your global uh, resource pool, uh, which is generated by creating uh, refineries. More on that in the next video. But um, the, the requirements in order to generate commodities are, includes like having over 1 million materials uh, in storage on a craft and that craft having a refinery on it which usually is only a factor in the late game anyway, and I have not actually used uh, this feature, even though I've beaten multiple campaigns. So this is slightly less essential. We'll cover that another time. And last one here is this is the supply chain index, which you would have noticed does not pop up if I set this to be a user or to not share any materials or energy with any other force. Uh, this is determining what uh, creators and cargo carriers, um, which... Uh, specific groups they share resources with so uh, as it says in the it's basically uh, the uh, higher indexes will hold on let's just read this out because that's easiest cargo units in a lower index than a creator will only be filled to their procurement levels not maximum capacity creators if they have a higher hype well that's already not spelt well if they have a higher index than a cargo unit will be filled to maximum by it, not just procurement. So basically it means that you can set up effective supply chains. You can have um, you can have a creator over here and say you want to build something next to it. And you can have a cargo a craft that is set to in a lower priority than it. So it gives all the materials it carries to it. And then it comes off and it goes off, fetches materials from another harvester, uh, takes it from there and brings it back and so you can kind of set um, that kind of supply chain going this also is not a hugely important feature 
Um, I haven't actually used this at all myself in my own campaign playthroughs, but um, like uh, if you want to specifically get things going without mucking too much around with uh, these um, kind of um, uh, material levels, so to speak, uh, then that can be quite useful. And um, in order to uh, demonstrate the next thing, uh, because that's the resources and we've covered U Re UI and the resource tab, and the final thing to note when um, uh, going into the campaign is um, vehicle types. So, over here we have an attack helicopter, which I'm very fond of. This is the Lacusta, in case you've never seen it before. And your vehicle type is basically uh, determined uh, by this section over here. So, I can designate basically any craft I like as a sea vehicle, an all-terrain vehicle, a land vehicle, or an air vehicle. And the main uh, purpose of these is to affect their pathfinding. So, if I designate the Lacusta as a sea vehicle for some reason, uh, you'll immediately notice, and I'm just going to pull over here and set that to maximum speed, you'll immediately see there's no altitude uh, measure there, and I can't change the altitude of this thing. And you'll also notice on the map, it will pathfind around land as much as possible. So if you go here, it'll pathfind around land, and if I set it to all-terrain vehicle, it will happily pathfind over land. Also, the voices change for this. Uh, but there's still no altitude measure. If I designate it as a land vehicle, if I go here, it will try and get uh, onto land as soon as possible. Uh, and if I, but if I designate it as an air vehicle, which it actually is, uh, you'll see suddenly it has an altitude measure, so I can set the altitude uh, when the vehicle is out of play. So, generally, when you spawn in a new thing, wherever it might be, let's just uh, get you... Uh, let's actually scrap you. Go there, pull you into play. If I spawn in a new vehicle, so I go new blueprint, uh, vehicle, go over here, and I'm just going to stick an AI on it so I can select it. So, new vehicle. Uh, you'll see that this is, by default, designated as an air vehicle, and that's just so you can... Are we going to collide with it? Yep, there we go. Uh, cheers, uh, that's very good of you. That's very cute, actually. We've been pushed along. Um, that is just so you can actually move the thing uh, wherever you like it. What is happening now? Wow, that's messed with you. Oh, that's what's happened. And this new vehicle is uh, actually too small to be considered a vehicle. Uh, because it's only two blocks, so we're going to scrap it. So, yeah, you want to set uh, what type of vehicle uh, your vehicle is, uh, preferably when you first build it, because uh, multiple times in campaigns, um, I've accidentally, like, not set this, and I've had, um, uh, say, ships try to travel over land, or tanks try to travel through water, and just other whoopsies like that. And this final button here is... Um, uh, just activating top speed movement mode, and what that means is, is that when the thing is out of play, um, it up. will move at the maximum speed it's been recorded at. And if you, uh, you can't actually disable that, um, when it's, uh, when it's in play. Actually, you actually can't disable that at all, by the looks of it. Interesting. Never really acknowledged that button before. So, yeah, and, um... That is... Alright, so that's the UI, that's the resources, and that's the vehicle types you need to worry about. And uh, now we can talk about the checklist of vehicles that uh, you should have before you get started in the campaign. And this will vary um, depending on what campaign you're doing with. If you're doing neater, uh, you'll want quite a wide range of vehicles from cheap to expensive and all that stuff. And if you're doing something like Ashes of the Empire, which is a land-based campaign, you want land vehicles, of course. If you're doing something like Ashes or Glau, uh, you want uh, vehicles within a certain volume limit so you can actually build them. And, um, yeah, with custom campaigns, like, who knows uh, what you'll actually need. You'll actually need to play them to find out. Um, because I haven't played any yet. I can't really talk about them. So, um, to start off with... Uh, First off, you'll need something that can fight, so 
the Lacusta is going to just stand in uh, for that because it's got missiles, it can fight things. And so your starter combat craft is ideally something cheap and versatile. So something that can handle a variety of the enemies that you might um, uh, run into when starting your campaign. So in terms of Nito, uh, the main Nito campaign, if you're starting on uh, the main location, like the primary location, um, uh, usually something that can handle both small targets, large targets, and uh, fast targets, slow targets will be enough. So the Lacusta would do just fine for that because it's armed with missiles. It can handle things like, and I really hope I'm not immediately proven wrong uh, by this, it can handle things like uh, the Flying Squirrel, which is a fast, annoying uh, little plane uh, that um, the Deep Water Guard likes to use. And I say it can handle that, and then all its missiles missed. That'll teach me to be cocky. Let's see. Can it actually do it? Can it actually do it? No, it can't. Alright, definitely need a different one. So perhaps not so good a starting vehicle, is it? Uh, but if you're starting on different difficulty settings, uh, you might very well uh, need uh, to have something uh, that's packing torpedoes, or advanced cannons, or even lasers, uh, depending on which uh, uh, difficulty campaign you're starting with. Because it all depends on what enemies are likely to come uh, get you first. So yeah, that's um, start a combat craft. And uh, the next thing you need, or this is in no particular, by the, uh, no particular order by the way, this is kind of just um, all the stuff you need. Uh, the next thing you need is a scout, and what that means is um, it doesn't have to be fast, but it does need to have a strategic antenna. So, um, I'm just going to spawn in my default uh, starting draft. Not just, no, no, what, what, what do you call it? Uh, so, uh, I, my favorite thing, which I've used literally for years, is this thing. It's a spy plane uh, called a Quetzer. And you can tell it's an old design because, it, well, frankly, it's really ugly. <laughs> so... This is a craft that has a strategic antenna on it that can reveal the fog of war and just allows you to spot enemy movements and respond to them more effectively. And the higher up the antenna, the more it sees, and the bigger the antenna, uh, the more it sees as well. So if you go here, you can see it's got an antenna uh, sticking out of its back. It's got a lot of dish pieces, and just on the campaign map, uh, this particular craft can see for a very, uh, very long way uh, because you can see that its altitude is set as high as it can go. This thing uh, cruises around uh, 2,000 meters up. It sees a very long way. And as a bonus, it's quite fast. It moves over 100 meters per second, so I can just have eyes in the sky looking every which way. Uh, it's uh, reasonably expensive as far as um, uh, satellite dishes go. Uh, so you might prefer, and a lot of people do this, to spawn in something like... Where is it? Here it is. So... Something like this, which is about a tenth of the cost, and it's literally just... It's a satellite dish, it is a... Just very basic uh, maneuver things, and an ACB to control these completely unpowered spin blocks. Well, no, Deadly Blades, rather. And that just gets uh, the thing uh, to the height where it can see things, and it's nice and cheap. So... Yeah, this is probably the cheapest option, particularly if you're playing uh, on a difficulty setting in which you don't have much resources, because that's one of the ways you can change difficulty, is by affecting how much salvage you get from destroying enemies. And a cheaper um, spy satellite, so to speak, might very well be a better choice than having uh, something fancy like uh, my spy plane. And speaking of things moving fast, uh, what are the things you're going to need... Uh, in combination with, or in addition with, uh, to your starter combat craft, is a fast response craft. So, this is a thing that is armed and dangerous, and preferably versatile. It can handle a uh, wide variety of enemies. Uh, but the main thing is it moves fast. So, it just can intercept or catch up to enemy craft that manage to, maybe they sneak behind you, or maybe they are coming in from a direction, or maybe they threaten... Uh, your supply line or something, and it's just it's an emergency response unit. So basically, like an ambulance, but it's armed and dangerous and it blows things up. So, planes tend to be very good for this. So, just an example, we have this guy right here. This is um, 
probably one of the first aircraft I'm ever remotely happy with. This is the Diamond Wasp. It's got a bunch of missiles. It's a fairly okay um, uh, kind of uh, fighter bomber. So we're here, and I believe this thing can, if this thing can't handle the Flying Squirrel, my goodness, I'm going to be extraordinarily embarrassed. Come on, you can do it. You can't do it, you damn fool. Darn it. Wow. How history repeats itself. So yeah, let's uh, spawn in something that can actually handle this. So just to prove that I have made things that can actually function as dogfighters. There we go. That almost worked. So yeah, the idea behind uh, things like this is just... Um, uh, things that can just respond to annoyingly fast things like this and deal with them uh, so they don't you so that your supply lines don't get completely destroyed uh, by something as uh, small fast and annoying uh, like this so yeah handy hint for dogfighters is just spray missiles all over the place and while that's happening well since these two things are doing the thing, um, having something that flies is generally a very good idea as well, because, uh, there you go, you cheeky bugger. Uh, having something that flies is, like, as you might expect, is a good thing to do, uh, because it allows it to transfer, to, like, basically pass over all kinds of terrain. So, out, you out, out, get it to do a world tour of the map, you'll see that out, it can out, out, cross out, over... Out, 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 uh, pretty much any terrain it likes, and particularly in places like, especially in the early game, uh, for Neater, this channel that's through Eriwerk is a bit risky for anything that's in the water, like ships, um, or submarines, uh, because um, the AI is a lot better than it used to be when it comes to avoiding terrain, uh, but it's still not perfect, and so your ships probably will run aground in here if you don't babysit them and manually control them. Uh, but an aircraft has no problem with uh, uh, with this particular arena because it can go over water, it can go over land, it's got no problems whatsoever. And um, there's not many other places uh, around here, like this uh, area around here, uh, over in the Cold Lock, uh, where you fight the Onyx Watch. A similar story, you've got these kind of um, islands here, there and everywhere, and um, just these uh, large peninsulas which uh, you can run aground on, and that's a bit of a pain in the butt. Uh, having a flying thing helps over there, and same with this kind of channel there, like especially if you're uh, starting on the second highest difficulty setting, you're over here and you want to push east uh, against the Steel Striders. Um, this is aircraft territory, for sure, because um, ships can't go on land unless you put wheels on them and designate them all terrain. But yeah, flying things are just handy like that because they can handle, they can fly over cliffs and mountains essentially. So, yeah, let's uh, go back over here, let's sit on, what's the next thing on the list? We got a resource gatherer, so, let's hop over to you, and let's uh, look at you for a second to illustrate our point. So, you've already guessed this, probably already, but you do need something that has material storage on it and resource gatherers. So, that's these things right here, just the resource tabs. Uh, you need this. Uh, or it's basically it's a uh, pallet swap, the oil drill. Back uh, in the day, from the depths had oil as a separate resource. Thank goodness it doesn't anymore. But these are the things that harvest materials. And each one gathers six materials per second if the resource zone has enough to provide that. And um, yeah, so uh, it's, al it's also allowed five seconds of 100% collection immediately after spawn to jumpstart a gatherer with zero materials, which means that. Um, for five seconds, it collects things for free and doesn't require power. Very useful. And, yeah, so you need something with this, and you need something that can carry a fairly large amount of resources. Um, for this uh, reasonably cheap uh, resource gathering platform, uh, 263,000 is... It is alright. Um, it's a... Uh, a lot of craft tend to get more expensive than that, especially in the late game. But for starters, this is good enough, and it will do. And speaking of resources, like you probably already guessed this as well, having a cargo craft is quite a good idea. So we go to support aircraft, 
And let's go to our friend here, the Fat Skink. So the Fat Skink is an airship, which is uh, RTG powered, so it doesn't need material itself to move. And it just carries a whole bunch of materials. It carries 664,000. And that's its job. It's to efficiently drive around the place and um, uh, pick up materials. And, like, it's not set as user. I need to... I need to do that. Save you, like, so... Pardon me, I'm just doing this on camera to illustrate my point. But yeah, so uh, basically you need something that can ferry materials here, there, and everywhere. That doesn't necessarily harvest them. Um, yeah, it's like... Uh, well, I should have finished that sentence, but I didn't. And the next thing you need is a builder. So you need, as um, the UI says... Uh, starting repairs on this electric vehicle, basically to build things you repair them from zero health to max and you need repair bots or repair tentacles. So if we go back down to the circle of harvester, uh, that's what these things are. Uh, repair units or repair tentacles or in this case compact repair tentacle. They also have the wibbly wobbly ones like this with physics on them. I prefer these ones. But, yeah, so these are the things you need in order for one uh, craft to repair another, and you need them to build things, whether they're in play or out of play. And you need at least one thing uh, with these on, although I tend to find it's good practice to stick at least one repair tentacle on every single craft you make, because it just means they can all repair each other, and if needs be, uh, you can build things... Uh, out in the field, so to speak. So if you have enough materials, you can just, you know, quickly build something and it's very versatile. But having dedicated builders just stuffed full of repair tentacles is also a pretty good idea, especially because these things are expensive and if your vehicles are at all likely to get destroyed, um, it's best not to have them uh, carry valuable materials into battle that might get blown up if you don't need them to. So when building big things, uh, it's better to have something that, um, uh, it's better to have something that can, you know, repair them quickly, but you're not going to risk uh, this investment in a straight fight. And one last thing which I recommend you do when you're starting a campaign or any campaign is uh, have some kind of backup uh, cheese vehicle, so to speak. So basically, uh, From the Depths as a game is full of things like exploits or cheesy tactics or things that just work like way like to things that work much better than other things uh, the meta uh, tends to constantly change with each patch but some things are more consistent than others and two of those things are spacecraft and submarines so these are two kinds of craft uh, that can punch many times above their own weight so to speak and these are useful as kind of backup uh, when things don't go the way you want them to. So I'll give you two examples of that. Let's uh, pull you over here. So in submarines, uh, we got over here. Let's look at the submarines. I built. haven't actually built that many. So something like this. This is a very cheap uh, submarine. It's called the Axolotl. And does it even have... Uh, it does. It does have a sonar decoy. So this is a very simple... A uh, little submarine. It's very cheap, so it's uh, just um, it's got rubber on it to protect against terrain, and it's got just it's actually armed with small uh, torpedoes. So these things right here that are mostly let's see, we've got explosive and we've got EMP, and this is let's get the fat skin out of here. Where are you? You you get out of here. And we'll just demonstrate on the fat skink why these things are a good idea. And uh, let's go to ship. Say you run into something like the crossbones. You're like, oh no. Oh no, indeed. This thing will shoot my, down my aircraft. It will blow up my ships and it's just a disaster. Uh, the crossbones happens to have a weakness in the form of... Uh, it is helpless against submarines. This is a deliberate flaw, uh, by the way. So you can not yell at me for that. Uh, but uh, it has no torpedoes, it has no uh, super cavitation rounds, it can't even detect things below the water. So, um, the axolotl is a hard counter uh, to it. And it means that uh, it's just an emergency backup plan uh, in case something shows up um, that uh, you cannot actually handle, that you don't have the materials uh, to handle uh, in a fair fight. 
And uh, whether you use this kind of cheesiness is entirely up to you. Uh, because it can make the game boring if you just curb stomp uh, the game with submarines or attack satellites or something like that. Uh, but I find, especially on higher difficulties, just having uh, things that either hang out underwater all the time or in space um, can be quite useful. And I'll give you an example of a spacecraft as well, and hopefully this doesn't get shot down immediately and make me look bad. So, this is the Starbird. So, similar thing, uh, very cheap, RTG powered. And um, it's just a bomber. That's all it is. And it, uh, it drives around uh, very fast and erratically. And um, it just drops bombs on things. Just two smart bombs, nothing too overpowered. But it's just uh, against anything that it doesn't have pretty darn good uh, anti-air capabilities. It's, um, it is like kind of overpowered. Like it'll happily uh, deal with it. And as you can see, it's even got a little uh, antenna on its bum, so it can double as a scout. And, like, it just moves around too erratically for um, a lot of um, uh, and for a lot of designs to hit properly. Uh, any decent anti-air guns will kill this thing in short order, I should mention. Also missiles. But you can make much, much uh, stronger uh, spacecraft than this. And on that note, speaking of the strategic antenna uh, on the starboard's bum... Uh, every single vehicle I have just listed um, is like you don't have to need to, uh, one in each category. You can have them um, overlap a bit. So, say the starter combat craft can also be your fast response craft. So, something like the Diamond Wasp, like I showed earlier, it's both fast and it's cheap and reasonably versatile. So, I can spawn that in and it can pull double duty. Um, Say, a resource gatherer and a cargo craft can be the same thing. Resource gatherers, cargo craft, and builders, um, I quite often they'll just be lumped into one. So something that can harvest resources, something that can carry a load of resources from here and there, and also something with a lot of repair tentacles on it can also... Um, uh, they, they can fit together quite nicely. They're not mutually exclusive at all. And also, like uh, the emergency cheese, you'll notice that... Um, uh, both the Axolotl uh, and the Starbird, they're quite cheap. So look over here, the Starbird is just uh, shy of 15,000 uh, materials. The Axolotl is about 16,000 materials. That is dirt cheap by From the Depth standards. And um, yeah, so uh, so yeah, these things can be starter combat craft as well. So yeah, that's basically it. So once you know how to work the UI, uh, once you know how to work the resource tab, once you um, have set your vehicles to be the correct type for the pathfinding, uh, and once you have uh, craft that kind of tick all the boxes of what you need uh, in a campaign, then you are ready to start a campaign of your choice. And so I will see you uh, on the campaign screen. So here we are on the single player uh, part of the main menu. And to start a campaign, you just go to new campaign and you've got a variety of choices. Um, in uh, particularly on the planet of Nator. So you switch campaigns by going here. And the three starting ones are Nator, uh, Glau, and Ashes of the Empire. So Nator is the big one. Nator is the one that's full of, um, that has the most options for the uh, campaign. There's a lot of like, this is the big one, and but then there's a whole load of smaller ones. Uh, Glau uh, is just like the mini-me version of Nator. It's just, it's got a volume limit. It is nice and short and quick, and it's actually uh, kind of, I have to say, a, a, more, a kind of more new player friendly version of Nita, because Nita can be quite big and scary. And then you've got Ashes of the Empire, uh, which is a land-based campaign. So this is where you go if you want to build tanks, so to speak. And uh, yeah, tanks and land vehicles and all that stuff. So we're sticking with Nita, we're going to new campaign, and... Um, these ones, uh, so, of all the pirates, Operation Iron Maiden, Steel Inquisition, uh, Surge Protection Protocol, The Ascension Project, and Scarlet Skies are all um, campaigns where only one out of the seven factions... Um, is it the seven factions? Or is it eight factions? Hang on, that's... Okay, Deep Border Guard, Onyx Watch, Lightning Hoods, White Flares, uh, Steel Striders, a Twin Guard, Grey Talon, Skull Dawn. The eight factions, sorry. You fight uh, one, only one of the eight factions. So the only ones that are missing from this lineup are the Deep Water Guard, which you start by uh, start fighting in the Crest of Anita anyway, and uh, 
and what do you what do you call it? And the uh, you can't fight the Scarlet Dawn uh, just by their own, possibly because that'd be really difficult. So yeah, avoid the pirates. Uh, you're just um, you're fighting only the Onyx Watch, Operation Iron Maiden. Uh, you're only fighting the White Flares, the Steel Inquisition, which I've started a playthrough of just the other day. Um, uh, you're only fighting uh, the Steel Striders, a Search Protection Protocol. Um, you are only fighting the Lightning Hoods. The Ascension Project, you're only fighting uh, the, twin, the Twin Guard. In Scarlet Skies, you're only fighting the Great Talons. So, um, they are pretty much in order of noob friendliness, because all these factions are somewhat harder than each other. Um, uh, the Onyx Watch is considerably easier than... is by far the easiest option out of all these things here, especially if you drop the difficulty down. But for now, we're going for the quest for Nita, which is the full campaign. It has a full backstory, which I can't read because the tooltip is cut off. Basically, the plot is um, pirates have ruined your life, and you're going to go uh, uh, beat the hell out of all of them. And after that, you decide to take over the world for some reason. Plot's not the main point of this game. But anyway, so if we go quest for Nita, and we launch... And, well, it says right down here, first time players. It is advised that if it, this is your first time playing, you should complete the tutorials that have been recommended to you and play on easy difficulty. Fair enough. So, uh, on that note, um, when starting your campaign, uh, pick your difficulty honestly. Do, like, don't push yourself, like, too hard. I keep making that mistake and keep having a horrible time as a result of it. And there is absolutely no shame in dropping the difficulty down if you just want to get used to how the campaign works first. And there's actually two ways to set difficulty. So there's these four ones here, and then there's individual custom settings. So uh, all of these uh, presets uh, allow, a, like, you may qualify for a scoreboard ranking. And... Adjustments of the difficulty or game configuration settings during the campaign will permanently shift your campaign into custom difficulty. So if you care about the leaderboard, you go with one of these presets. And there's different uh, background here, but basically um, uh, there's like setting one of these presets determines your starting location on the map. So if you go with easy, uh, you start in the uh, southwest corner of the Neater map. So you start off fighting the Deepwater Guard, and if you so choose, the Onyx Watch, which are the two easiest factions in the game, generally speaking. If you go on medium, um, uh, you start um, on the... Uh, you start on the southeast side of the map, uh, which means that um, you are starting off by fighting the Lightning Hoods, and the White Flares, which is already much more difficult uh, than the easy starting location because both the White Flares and the Lightning Hoods are considerably more difficult and more nuanced to fight than either the Deep Water Guard or the Onyx Watch. So, and then on hard, and this is already getting quite difficult, as um, you start in the northwest corner of the map. And this means you start by fighting the Twin Guard and the Steel Striders, and those two factions are, uh, especially um, because of the contrast between uh, their two, like, faction aesthetics, so to speak, um, this can be quite difficult. What works against the Twin Guard does not necessarily work against the Steel Striders, and what works against the Steel Striders does not necessarily work against the Twin Guard. And they're both uh, pretty hard factions, especially if you're a new player. And then you have Very Hard, and this starts you right in the middle of the map, fighting every single faction at once. After a set amount of time, they all declare war on you, and you have to deal with them all at once. And I speak from bitter experience uh, uh, here that um, you only do this if you are a bit of a masochist, and you are very experienced at From the Depths, and you really want to test yourself. You want to push your designs to the limit, and you want... Um, the to the des uh, like the designs to kind of overwhelm you non-stop can confirm this is not fun like even the game developers themselves have had a huge amount of difficulty beating this difficulty setting so um for now just as for demonstration purposes we're going to go with easy and then we're going to use some custom settings so custom settings are like this so 
First up, we have the dam uh, the damage difficulty slider, which basically no one uses because it kind of defies the point of the game. It increases enemy damage and decreases your damage. If you set this to 5, you'll do uh, 25 uh, times less damage than the enemy. If you set it to 0 0.2, you'll do 25 times more damage, so 0 0.2. So basically enemies will do 20% damage to you, and you'll do 25 times more damage to them. And 1 is the default value for good reason, because that means your uh, enemy craft and your craft are on equal footing. I do really do not understand the point of setting it lower unless you really want to meditate, <laughs> so to speak, and you just want to have a cruisy time. Or if you just want to make some uh, sweet montages or something. And setting it higher is if, like, you are a real masochist and you... Uh, want you want a handicap and basically you've beaten very hard uh, difficulty multiple times with regular damage and you just want to and you just want to beat your head against a brick wall a bit more so uh, the other three options here tend to get messed with a lot more and uh, the enemy growth factor this is the rate in which enemy forces grow higher numbers result in lots of fleets and fast fortification of enemy land so Generally speaking, uh, setting this lower means that you'll get less stuff thrown at you and they'll build less defensive structures around their own uh, resource zones. Setting it high means they build lots of stuff and they build more expensive stuff sooner and they will uh, come and get you uh, much quicker. And the resource given by destroying enemy is, ten uh, is basically determining like what percentage of an enemy craft is... Um, how much resources are dropped when it gets destroyed, so to speak. So, on max, it's uh, set to 10%. So, say, if something uh, that is 1,000 uh, materials gets destroyed uh, by your forces, it'll leave a little thing on the map that is worth 100 materials, and you can salvage that and use it for your own purposes. And resource given by destroying enemy 10% first playthrough. Uh, you can set this low again if you want to challenge yourself. You can set it all the way down to zero so they don't drop anything when they get destroyed. And just for giggles, uh, we're going to do uh, that right now. Enemy growth factor 200%, resource given by destroying enemy 0%. And combat, uh, the combat slider determines the difficulty of design. So uh, the designs in front of the depth, they go from uh, easy, medium, uh, easy, medium, hard, and godly. And godly designs, uh, well, harder designs tend to be uh, more meta, generally. They tend to be bigger, they tend to be more expensive, and just overall uh, more challenging to face uh, than easier designs. And so, um, you basically set this to max when you want to pretty much test your building skills against um, the keepers of the lore and the developers and the ones who kind of... Um, collated all the faction craft that are in the game. So for the purposes of this demonstration, we're going to set this to less challenging, uh, just for giggles. So enemy growth factor, we're setting that to 200%, so we get lots of stuff early. Resource given by destroying enemy 0%, expert player, combat less challenging. So let's just make sure this determines your starting location. So click there, go custom settings, this, and you can tell which one is which just by uh, the text below here. So here we'll be starting in the easy location, here we'll be starting medium, here we'll be starting hard, and here we'll be starting very hard. So let's go with easy, uh, set uh, this to what we want, and we can hit the button. So now we are in the campaign, and we're probably going to get a dialogue box uh, very soon. Is it going to be very soon? Very soon? Very soon. Or not. I guess not. So, immediately you'll see that um, pretty much every campaign you do, you have a starting fortress and a starting vehicle. And this is where things get a bit RTS-like, in that there is a, a build order. Like, what you do first uh, kind of determines a lot of other things. And you do things uh, early and in the right order, just you have a much better time of things. And so the first thing that I usually do is that I retrofit or scrap the starting fortress and starting vehicle. Uh, because uh, uh, the starting fortress looks quite cool, uh, but is uh, of questionable value. It's uh, got a lot of material uh, rigged up on it, and like it's, like, it's got too much resource invested in looking pretty, and we're not going to be looking at this thing much. So we're going to retrofit it into 
uh, that circular resource fortress that we had uh, before. So suddenly now uh, we have uh, gained a fair amount of materials from that. And over here uh, we have the starting rib and we're just going to uh, delete this thing entirely. So there we just gained uh, 2,500 uh, materials. And so now uh, we have... Uh, 22,000 materials uh, to play with, which is just enough to start uh, building some stuff. So, if you look on the map, you can tell how much um, uh, material growth there is, and how much material is in reserve on your uh, on a resource zone. And the way this works in From the Depths is that um, there's a universal uh, material limit, and resource zones will regenerate or not, depending on like, where the resources are at, and where resources kind of get dumped, so to speak. And so, over here right now, we need to build some things, so... Uh, the next thing I usually do is I build a scout craft. So, I'm here, and I'm just going to... There's multiple ways to load in vehicles into the game to get them repaired, but I usually just go to the vehicle menu, and I go here, sport aircraft, and can we afford a Quetzal? Yes, we can. So, we're just going to load in our spy plane... And we're going to yeah, repair that, and you'll see she's repairing uh, quite nicely. And these sliders down here allowed you to speed up time. So, I'm going to speed up time a little bit. Just a little bit. And now we wait for a little bit longer, and then... Uh, now, uh, we have our spy plane in, we don't need a spawner in. But, um, let's just check here... Yeah, and the Quetzal also doubles as a kind of improvised cargo oh, yeah. plane. So, you see here, the amount of satellite uh, uh, dishes on uh, the Quetzal allow her to see uh, very, very far. Um, and I'm gonna send her over here, just to capture uh, this tile, because capturing tiles is another part of um, uh, the campaign. Um, uh, one of the main things to note about the campaign is that in captured tiles, you can only uh, repair or build craft in or right next to a friendly tile. So in this particular case, um, I can build things in these three tiles uh, surrounding my starting position. I cannot build or repair anything in any tiles further than that, whether they're enemy territory or not. They have to be mine. And I can only capture tiles that are right next to me. So I can't just uh, uh, bugger off somewhere like over here with the Quetzal and capture something. Uh, because that's not how it works. And uh, the next thing I usually do. So I've got uh, my, uh, my spy plane up and running so I can see what's happening. And additional resource harvesters if needed. I'm just going to go over here. And I'm just going to spawn in just to speed things up a little bit. I'm going to build a very, very small cargo helicopter. I, um, when I first played the Glau campaign, I improvised these things. Um, that was on a stream. It was good times. So hit pull all. So now this thing is being repaired. Bit by bit, probably. There we go. And see, it's... Um, Already 98% um, built, and now, so now it should be uh, harvesting materials as well. Excuse you, back down here so we can see you. So, you are also cargo. Uh, what's uh, doing? It's, I need to actually spawn you in. See. Well, I guess I didn't put um, resource gatherers on these things. Oh well. But yeah, so that's uh, one thing you could do. But the next thing you should do once you've got resource harvesting and eyes up in the eyes up in the sky, um, you want to build a starting combat craft. In this particular campaign, I'm going to be uh, quite aggressive, so I'm going to spawn in a. What should I spawn in? I need something nice and versatile. Uh, that's probably too expensive. Well, we're going to be blowing things up a little bit, so I'm going to spawn in a Sapphire B, uh, which is quite an effective uh, bomber. And it's only slightly more expensive than its um, uh, fellow aircraft. So I'm going to go here, going to speed up time, so we're going to get our Sapphire B uh, up on the go. Okay, so we've got our Sapphire B, and she's just filling up with materials right there. And while we're waiting for that, we're just going to capture some more territory. And 
There's two things you could do right now. I already mentioned that I'm going to be quite aggressive, just to show you a little bit of action in this video. Uh, but there's two approaches here, and this kind of depends on what difficulty setting you're working with, or what self-imposed challenge you've set yourself, or just your general playstyle, and that at this point, you can either sit back and wait for the first uh, faction to declare war on you, or you can um, basically start offensive yourself. You can declare war from the diplomacy screen. You can go here, relationships, and you can basically click uh, on this in order to um, basically declare war on them. So yeah, as soon as our bomber uh, has sufficient materials, uh, we're gonna do exactly that. Okay, so we've got our Sapphire B, and we are going to um, declare war on the Deep Water God. So we're going to go here, we're going to go to relationships, and we'll go declare war. So now they're seeking reprisal. And of course, you don't have to do that. You can just move your um, uh, craft directly into their territory, which actually. Um, escalates things a little bit more slowly because when they're at seeking reprisal uh, that's the point where they start sending stuff at you and um, if you just move your forces into their territory uh, they will just um, they'll start uh, uh, they will kind of send things more slowly at you so it depends on what you have to do although if you want to start capturing your stuff early uh, that is something you can definitely do here so now we can speed up time a little bit. Spy plane is going to hang out over there. And I'm just going to capture this uh, tile so that if uh, our aircraft gets damaged, um, we, can still, uh, we can still fight, we can still repair it. So yeah, that is an important thing to do. And right there is the point where all the other factions have decided to start fighting each other. So. In the NATO campaign, uh, the factions fight each other, uh, as well as you, so uh, that is, uh, that is um, an important distinction. It is possible to hold off on attacking uh, some factions in favor of others, and they will engage with each other, they will destroy each other, so it can be helpful to pick and choose who you go to war with in what order, depending on what situation you are in. And um, I believe that uh, allying uh, with factions and winning the game without destroying them is, uh, I think it's planned in a future update or a future patch. So now, oh, wait, 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 crap, I should have said that better. But anyway, that was a reflex. So, um, engaging in combat, when you have a craft selected, you click uh, on the crossed sword icon uh, that appeared um, when an enemy is close enough. And that will start a combat with a countdown, just in case you decide to change your mind last second. And this is the screen in which you um, uh, place your units. So, in this case we've got an aircraft, so if I just right click there, it will spawn at an altitude of zero uh, out of its max altitude. So I don't want to do that, I want to hold right click, and I want to set it to its maximum altitude, or something close to it. Uh, so that it spawns in the air, where I want her to be. And the other thing to note is that there's the battle size slider right here. Uh, uh, talking about how many uh, blocks can be in play uh, right now. So at the moment it's set to, um, well now it's set to 3.5 uh, thousand uh, cubic meters, which means uh, 3,500 blocks can be in play. This can be set as high as your PC can manage. That's the main point of that. And the magic wand right next to it can be to set the spawn order of whatever forces you have in play. Because if you're not spawning everything uh, in at once, you can set what spawns in first, what shows up to fight uh, first. So you can also order it um, right here with maximum priority, uh, just hitting that button. In this case, we've only got one uh, craft that's going to be fighting, so we're going to go uh, with that. And the begin ba cancel battle allows you to do this, and just um, be absolute, just in case you. Say you engage with something and then you realize, oh wait, that's not the thing I thought it was. Ugh. You can cancel out and it's all good. And you can set it up again, whatever you like, once things are in range. So we're here. And you can also hit begin battle. 
And that's what we're gonna do right now. We're going to basically troll uh, this, uh, this outpost uh, with large missiles, because we have them. So in this particular case, uh, the Sinner's outpost um, can't actually hit us very well because it doesn't have very good anti-air. Oh my goodness. So that was an impressive shot. And I should mention as well, in the campaign, uh, capturing things is quite handy. And that thing actually managed to hit us, how annoying. And one of the useful things about planes is that when you just rock up on top of them, you'll see that uh, we're repairing this craft because it's uh, near friendly territory, very convenient, is that when you jump off... Oh, that was too far. So yeah, you can land on things and capture them. And since um, we're not getting any salvage from destroying this, we might as well um, capture it. And it's entirely at your discretion how often you want to do this, uh, because this is arguably kind of a cheesy thing to do. I'm just going to snipe that AA gun uh, so it doesn't destroy my aircraft by accident. And then we got to go find the mainframe, which conveniently is right here. So here we have uh, the Sinner's Outpost, which we can immediately, uh, once we pull it out of play, Listening. retrofit into something of ours. So let's go over here, go to Fortresses, and Resource Fortresses, Circle Harvester. And so, uh, Sinner's Outpost is 33,000 materials, proposed re retrofit is 23,000 materials, so we can do that absolutely fine, and that's Listening. all fine and dandy. And Listening. we can capture the square and the conquest carries on. So, um, we can talk about strategy for a moment here. Um, uh, if you want to be aggressive, um, one of the things you can do is send a starter or fast response craft off to raid enemy supply craft. And uh, my first episode of doing the Steel Inquisition campaign is a brilliant example of that, not to toot my own horn. Uh, because if you destroy enemy resource zones and destroy enemy cargo craft, um, like very early in the game, you essentially cripple their ability to make bigger, more expensive, more dangerous stuff, which makes campaigns way easier to do if you're just concerned with winning. Uh, but if you want to be defensive, uh, your focus should be on harvesting resources in the zones you have, building the largest, most powerful and versatile craft that you can, and doing this is often a more self-imposed challenge if you want to see a wider variety of craft uh, in the game, because otherwise you might not see um, all the um, wonderful designs that uh, the uh, Keepers of the Lore and uh, the community has created for this game. Uh, but it's also apparently a viable strategy on the higher difficulties where you can't actually spread yourself too thin, especially the highest difficulty where you are surrounded, and it's actually best to let the... Um, enemy factions like fight each other and you just um, essentially act like a goalie and just you know build up and uh, take advantage of your resource zones and just sit there so over there yeah see there's a walrus that is a supply thing and I could go and attack that and over here we have our first major obstacle which is gonna require more than one uh, sapphire B uh, to deal with so let us start Moving up a out. trade route Moving just out. here Moving out. Uh, with this tiny helicopter. And that's basically it uh, for um, campaign basics. So it's just the things you need to do before you start the campaign. Um, the things you need to optimize your craft towards when you're building in the designer. And like you know, picking your difficulty and just your build order uh, when you get into the campaign proper. So. I hope you found this helpful, and if you already knew all the most of the stuff, I hope you found it interesting regardless. And thank you all so much for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. Support me on Patreon or YouTube membership if you like, it really helps, and there's fun perks in it for you. Thank you to all my current supporters, and I will see you next time in From the Depths. And if you decide to start a campaign, uh, good luck with it, and have fun. At the end of the day, it's about having a good time. Farewell!